Okay, and welcome to the second tutorial. This objective, we're going to focus more on domain. We're going to state the domain of various functions. So if you flip over to this part of our notes, now we're in section 2.1, uh, domain restrictions. So again, let's put the definition of domain because we can't write that enough, I guess. Um, the domain is the set of all x values that satisfy the function. Okay, so all the x values that work in the function, basically. Um, there's really only two types of domain restrictions. There's two types of domain restrictions. First, um, we have to restrict any x value that makes a denominator equal to zero. That makes a denominator equal to zero. That has to be taken out of the domain. That makes a denominator equal to zero. That's no good. We already kind of looked at that one and we'll look at it again. Um, the second restriction, we have to take away any x value that makes an even radicand negative. So this is the other thing we have to look out for. We have to look out for even radicands. That's square roots, that's fourth roots, that's tenth roots. Any even radicand cannot be negative. It's okay to have a cube root of a negative or a fifth root of a negative, but if it's an even radicand, meaning a, a two or four or ten for the index, we cannot have a negative underneath there because that would be an imaginary concept. So these are really the two restrictions we have to watch out for today. So I've got four different examples to illustrate this. What I'd like to do is describe the domain for each of these functions using interval notation and set notation. I know that I'm just going to have you choose which one you'd rather do, but for, for our practice, I'd like to do uh, both of the notations for each of these problems. You'll see which one we maybe would choose um, um, w w when I give you the choice. But for right now, let's just do both. Okay, so we're looking at A of X right now. A of x has a denominator. That's what I'm looking at first. I see that the denominator is there so that the denominator cannot be 0. So you might already say, well, I know that x can't be 3. And that's great, but there's still another number that x cannot be. And some people can just see this in their head. Um, if you ever have trouble finding what makes the denominator 0, just set the denominator equal to 0 and solve that equation. Now, you can solve it's quadratic, so there are going to be two values. You could solve this by factoring. This is a difference of two squares, x plus 3 times x minus 3 equals to 0. Or you could solve by just adding the 9 to the other side and taking the square root. Just remember, when you take the square root, you're taking both positive and negative roots. These are the two numbers that must be restricted from our domain. So let's do set notation first. I'll do my set notation right here. Set notation is going to be the set of all x's such that x is not equal to those two numbers. That's it. That's our set notation. I tend to use set notation when I'm describing the domain that's restricted from a denominator. But we can also do interval notation. Interval notation will be right here. Interval notation, we have to describe all of the numbers that are not 3 and not negative 3. So I look along my um, entire number line, and I start with the very first value, or concept in this case, negative infinity, and I'm going to go all the way up to the first restriction, which happens to be negative 3. So negative 3 cannot be in my domain. And uh, since there's more numbers, I'm going to union this together with another interval. So everything after negative 3 will start to work until we get to the positive 3. So we're going to need to restrict that, parentheses, because we're not including those numbers. And I believe there's more, so I'm going to union yet again with another interval. This is everything greater than 3, and then there's no restrictions after that. So it would actually be three different intervals to describe this in interval notation. I feel like it's a little bit easier to describe set notation, but again, I wanted to practice both of them, and you can take your pick as long as it is a correct notation. It does not matter to me which one you prefer.
So we've got our set notation here and our interval notation here. Alrighty. Let's look at our second one. Our second one is dealing with our second type of restriction. I see an even radicand. I know it's even because this is a square root. There's a little index of a 2 right here. And I know that x cannot be a number that would make this radicand negative. It's OK to have the square root of 0. So don't worry about x being 4. 4 minus 4 is 0, and the square root of 0 exists. But worry about x being 5. Because if we have 4 minus 5, then we have a negative. And the square root of a negative is imaginary, and we're not talking about imaginaries on our real number line. So some people can just see the answer to this, like I said, and go straight to the answer. If you ever have trouble figuring out what the radicand cannot be, just understand that whatever that radicand is, it's 4 minus x in this case, just force it to be greater than or equal to 0. That's it. it the, the radicand has to be positive, and it's OK if it's equal to 0. So just force it to be greater than or equal to 0 and solve. That's really all you need to do, and you'll have all of your x values that work. If you want to solve this, you could subtract by 4. And you'll have negative x is greater than or equal to negative 4. And then when you divide by negative 1, please understand with radicals, when you divide or multiply by a negative, the radical, excuse me, not radical, um, inequalities, the inequality symbol will change. So when you divide by a negative, the greater than or equal to will switch to a less than or equal to. So we're talking about all the numbers that are less than or equal to 4. So 4 works. 3.9 works, 3.8 works, 3 works, 2 works, negative 7 works, all the numbers that are less than or equal to 4. So now I need to describe this in set notation or interval notation. I'm going to do both. So let's do set notation. Actually, set notation is basically almost finished for set notation right now. Since we already solved it, set notation is just putting that thing underneath or uh, inside our little set marks. That's really it. So the set of all x is such that x is less than or equal to 4, and then close the set. There's our set notation. Our interval notation would just be describing a single interval, which is kind of nice, as opposed to the last one, which had three intervals. Our interval notation, we're describing all the numbers less than or equal to 4 all the way down to negative infinity. So that must be where I'm starting at negative infinity. I'm going all the way to 4. And this time, because 4 is OK to be in the domain, I'm going to use a bracket. And there's my interval notation for that one. Again, doesn't matter which one. Actually, either one looks pretty easy to write. We're looking at part C c of x equals 5x plus 1. I'm looking for restrictions on x. The first thing I'm looking for is uh, a denominator. I don't see a denominator that has a variable, so there's no denominator restriction. The next thing I'm looking for is my even radicand. And since I don't see a square root or a fourth root or a sixth root, there's no restriction there. So it doesn't look like there's any restriction, which means that x can be anything. So there is no restriction. x is all reals. So if I do set notation, let me show you what all reals looks like in set notation. Um, really what I do, I do my little set marks and do the big capital R for the real numbers. It's a little double R, but capital R for the real numbers. Uh, some people do the set of all x is such that x is an element of the real number system. And they use that little fancy E thing for is an element of. I think this is the fastest way to write all reals. So that's what I'm going to tend to do. The set of all reals, just that big capital R. So there's our set notation. Interval notation is pretty simple as well here. Interval notation. If it's every number, we are going from negative infinity all the way to positive infinity. And that's it. There's no restriction on the value of x. So these are the two different ways that you can correctly write um, all reals. You can use your set notation, which I think is the fastest, and or you can use your interval notation, which has the infinities in parentheses with the comma. OK. And our last one to illustrate this, we've got this um, 
equation v equals 4 thirds times pi times r cubed. Now obviously we've changed our variable to an x and that or fr to, from an x to an r and that's okay that doesn't matter about the variables but that must mean that we're using some sort of formula and I imagine that this is going to be a volume formula. Does anybody know what this formula is the volume of? Well this is the volume of a sphere this is the volume of a sphere, okay? So, I, I except that I know that it's a volume formula, I know there's not a denominator that has a variable in it, and I know that there's not an even radical. So you might just say it's just like part C where there's not gonna be a restriction, but there actually is a different type of restriction in this case. Since we are talking about a sphere, there's sort of a reality restriction. I've never seen a sphere that has a negative radius, right? So there has to be some sort of reality restriction on our radius. The radius is not gonna be a negative. The radius could be zero because then we don't have a sphere at all, but the radius most likely will be some positive number. So that, there's some sort of reality restriction here. So since we know that R, the radius of our um, sphere, R must be um, I'm going to say zero or positive, that's ultimately what has to be in reality for us to even have a sphere. So let's do our set notation first. If R must be positive, then we're simply saying the set of all R such that R is greater than, I'll say, or equal to zero. I know it might be silly to say that R equals zero because then we don't even have a sphere, but that is possible. R just can't be a negative. Okay, so there's our set notation. Our interval notation for the same formula, our interval notation, if R basically has to be zero or anything positive, we can start with zero, include the zero, and go on up to infinity. Of course, we'll never reach infinity. That's why we use the parenthesis. So through these four examples, I hope that I've illustrated set notation and interval notation. You might even say sometimes it makes sen more sense to use set notation, and sometimes it might make more sense for interval notation. Take your pick. I will not require you to do both each time as long as you use one of them correctly. And you can alternate from one to the other. So let's flip over to our final two problems. I have two tries for you, one from each of our restrictions. If you could please pause the tutorial at this point and try these two problems, see if you can get the correct answers, and then come back on and start the video back up. If you could please pause right now and try these two. Pause. So in this first one, if you had trouble, I'm sure you set the denominator equal to zero like I asked you to do. Um, if you had trouble seeing this, well, it's easier if you factor first. There's a possibility of three, since it's a cubic in the denominator, a possibility of three restrictions for x. When I factor this, it's a binomial, so there must be a, some sort of special pattern, and it's just a simple little GCF idea. When I pull the x out, I'm left with an x, of course, on the outside, x squared plus one on the inside. That means that x could be equal to zero, and that means that x, plus one, x squared plus 1 could be equal to 0. Well, x squared plus 1 equaling 0 doesn't make much sense because that would mean that x squared equals negative 1. So that's, excuse me, and that's not going to give any um, real value. So x equals 0 is the only one that would make the denominator 0. So here's my set notation for that. Here's my interval notation for that. Okay. The second one, you might have just said, okay, the radicand cannot be, it has to be greater than or equal to zero. N you have not yet solved a quadratic inequality before. That's actually a topic we're going to look at a little bit later. So at this point, really all you have is your logic. You're talking about what numbers can x be. Okay, so obviously 4 is okay because 4 squared is 16 and 16 minus 16 is 0, so 4 is okay. But that would also mean that negative 4 is okay.
Some people say at first they know that 4 is okay and 5 and 6 and 7 and all the numbers that are greater than 4, and that's great. And they say that this is their answer, but that's really only half of it. Because if 4, 5, and 6 work, then wouldn't negative 4, negative 5, and negative 6 also work? So that means that there's actually two branches of answers. All the numbers that are greater than or equal to 4, but then all the numbers that are less than or equal to negative 4 would also work because the opposites, when squared, are still the same positives. So that was a cool little logic one that you had to think out. Um, so here's my set notation and here's my interval notation for that. Okay, that's the end of this tutorial. I appreciate your watching this. We'll see you in class. We'll practice this more and I can answer any of your questions. Thank you and bye.